What's up, beautiful people? This is episode 44 of An Untold Narrative. Uh, I'm super excited today to feature somebody because it's a new category that we're getting into. Although it's around the footwear world, it's a new uh, kind of branch off extension of somebody new uh, in the field of uh, law and being a lawyer and somebody who has got the title of Esquire, I believe, or something crazy like that. So without further ado, uh, Zach Kurtz, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> it was good. And uh, like I said, I appreciate you having me and having the show in general. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, it's rare because we, we've had photographers, videographers, artists, uh, curators, uh, sneaker designers themselves, but really getting into a niche category of law is something I'm pretty interested in myself and just to learn your perspective on the whole thing. And if for all our listeners uh, or viewers watching on YouTube, Zach has this beautiful sneaker wall behind him. So I highly recommend everybody go check out the YouTube um, because it is magical. Uh, he's got, I don't know how many, how many, let's start off with this question, right? Because we run off the top of our brain. How many pairs of sneakers do you have? Uh, so the wall, I think I got some of it over here, but the wall is around 120 something in the wall. And I have a closet back there, but just like you guys and everyone else, I love sneakers. And that's sort of how my career in business sort of began because I, I wanted sneakers and I had to figure out a way how to get them. <laughs> Dude, that's a, yeah, just in the wall itself. I mean, that's, that's like a museum right there and they're all color coded and shit. <laughs> I'm not, I don't discriminate. So no matter what brand it is, what design or what color, you know, if I like it, I like it. And that's why I try to put it in the wall and keep it. <laughs> so we, we were chatting just uh, offline just before, uh, I think you mentioned your, your base that in New York, but talk a little bit about uh, yourself, kind of where you are, where you come from, uh, how you got into law uh, in general, and then we'll kind of transition our way into sneakers more and more in depth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so what I guess my 30 second elevator pitch that I say is I say I'm a creative, you know, creative with inside a lawyer's body, or I guess that's a two second elevator pitch. But uh, <laughs> my background is born in New York. My grandfather was a judge. Uh, and just seeing what he did sort of, you know, impressed me and made me always have the law in the back of my mind. Uh, but my mother and father are the exact opposite as my grandfather. <laughs> They're creatives. Uh, my mom graduated from Parsons in New York and my dad graduated from FIT in New York. And my mom yeah. is a painter and teacher of uh, paint and art and all that. And my dad's just, they're both awesome. My dad's just a crazy, weird thinking kind of guy. <laughs> and that's where I, I get a lot of my creativity from. Uh, the reason I said it is because after FIT, he worked in the Garment Center in New York. And then uh, at one point, he just decided to pick my family up uh, when I was about 12 or 13 and moved from New York to Blacksburg, Virginia, which is totally different uh, and the lifestyle and the speed and everything going on and we did it and he uh, actually worked with my cousin to have a restaurant called Sharky's and he did all the six foot paper mache sharks and all this stuff uh, to come hanging out of the wall look like you're getting attacked by a shark and my mom did all the painting and all that kind of stuff at the restaurant and that was sort of what got us away from black got us away from New York into Blacksburg and doing all that art stuff uh, and then my dad segued into green energy building. Uh, where he builds straw bale houses. Uh, the first one he did was called an earth ship, I remember. It was, it was wild. He like, it was literally dragging me and my sister to get tires and put mud in it to build a house for my dog. This is literally what he dragged, free work. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like all that, it was right before the whole green energy phase came around. So it was his first thing uh, designed. And then it just turned into a straw bale house, which is the house we live in to this day. Uh, so I really had that creative background from them. Uh, just thinking differently and thinking weird and they we never had tv or anything or espn or anything growing up we we're old school like that so every day i'd come home and do my homework and go outside play soccer and basketball and then go to the art studio and do stuff with my parents so so are you are you to that to that note are you do you do you paint are you creative or are you just like i think i try to be honest i mean i if, I think I was asking you questions on like, hey, if I want to start learning how to draw these sneaker designs like you guys are doing, what equipment do I get? You know, do I get an apple? Do I get a drawing pad? So, and I, and I try, but to be honest, I'm certainly not like you guys. <laughs> and the more I work with sneaker designers and people like that, you know, the, the more I see what they're doing and the more I pick up. And that's, that's really where my interest came. I, I love being a designer and a creative. And I think my parents had that talent and I just wanted to work with them on the legal side. But, you know, the more I see it and the more I do it, the more practice I want and the more I want to, you know, merge the two. So that's, it's nasty. 
That's super cool and interesting. How did you, how did you, uh, did you always have, you, you, you mentioned a little bit of your youth and growing up from between New York and Virginia. Did you always have a love and a passion for sneakers or like, is this just something when you hit like 18 or 25 or whatever it was like that you fell in love? So I always, I've always loved sneakers. My mom, they're creatives, but my mom, she says her famous line is, oh, when I had you in my stomach, Zach, I was selling shoes in New York. That's, that's why she, she sees my sneaker one goes, oh, it's all because of me. She takes all the credit for it. But uh, I, I feel like I've always loved fashion and sneaker from them. But growing up in New York, especially when, when I grew up, I'm 36 now. So it was time with Jordan and the Knicks and Starks. And dude, you're, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, time out, time out. You're 36? Yeah, I'm an old man, dude. I, <laughs> dude. You look fucking beautiful for 36. Thank you, thank you. It's that Pharrell <laughs> moisturizer. Go, that's the second time I'm going to call it. People go check out our YouTube because this is what, like, this man looks like he's 24. <laughs> I'll take it, man. I'll take it, especially now that I'm single, so I'll take it. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I really, I have to give you this stuff. My buddy sent me this green Pharrell stuff that I've been using, and I think it's definitely aging me nicely, so. <laughs> Uh, uh, plug plug in Pharrell's brand real quick. <laughs> exactly, right here. <laughs> um, sorry for derailing the conversation there, but that's okay. that's cool. Um, when um, where, where, I I read quickly on your website, uh, I think it was Roanoke College that you graduated from, or am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah. So in short, Roanoke is right next to Virginia Tech, which is Blacksburg, which is where I grew up and moved in. And I guess tying this into your previous question, I've always like sports for whatever reason at first i wanted to play basketball uh didn't grow i'm still five six <laughs> so i decided a better sport would be soccer <laughs> so uh I, but i always collected the basketball shoes and you know loved the brand and hip-hop and following everything so i was really vested in that culture and everything and i guess growing up i played sports and that's really how the sneakers and the apparel and the footwear came into play because as you know times have changed in the 36 and even 20 years that we've grown and for me, I played soccer in college at Roanoke uh, and overseas and all over my whole life. I, I got very fortunate to play with a guy who was really good. So all the scouts were watching us and I, it just it brought me into the game and it brought me into, you know, soccer and how sports and everything interacts. And it was a great opportunity, but it also let me see, you know, Adidas. <laughs> you know, to me, Adidas runs soccer and how sports equipment is used and all this and everything has just changed uh, in in that amount of time so it was a great opportunity for me to see apparel industry and get involved in it and then sort of work behind the scenes from branding and business and uh, it opened my eyes up doing that as a player and then when I actually was old enough to work in the business I said hey I remember those times that this happened and that happened so it was very good transferable skills yeah I mean you're you're just being able to provide context so it's not like you're oh hey here's my service that I'm offering on, on the business perspective but you're actually able to bring it down to ground floor so everybody understands the same talking language exactly and that's sort of how sneaker law firm and sort of everything fell in place uh, I, I knew what I wanted to do I know I wanted to work in sports and sports law but you know there's a million different types of sports law and kind of things out there but just the fact that I played soccer and I had the interaction with buying soccer cleats every month and buying basketball shoes every couple months and I mean, you know, back in the day, there was no internet like this. So if we had a soccer cleat and we wanted to return it, I had to call up Eurosport, send it back, wait a couple months, and, you know, stuff's different. So just getting that interaction and falling in love with shoes and passion and doing all that stuff really opened my eyes up to, you know, the sport and that it's not just a soccer shoe or it's not just a little logo. You know, it's, it's a brand. And yeah. It's amazing just to see that and, you know, playing sports and having that experience allowed me to develop and know what I want to do in the future, so to speak. So speaking to, to that note, and you, you mentioned it a little bit there, um, how did you, the, you talked about your grandfather being a judge did, in high school. Did you know that you were going to go try to be a lawyer or like, what were you going to like veer off into sports management or whatever, like in terms of interest or like, how did, how did you actually like find out that like, I'm going to be a lawyer? Yeah, no, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, I thought I was going to be a basketball player, crossed that off the list, went on <laughs> a professional soccer player. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like I said, I played overseas and it was great, but I realized that, holy crap, these guys are awesome. Yeah, even if, you know how it is in the EPL, like one of my buddies wrote a book. I actually played growing up with the first, uh, what's called American, to play in Arsenal. Uh, oh, so, good. Yeah, it's, it's wild. And just seeing his level and talent, I wanted to do that, but I knew I couldn't do that. <laughs> couldn't be on that level. So it really just opened my eyes to say, okay, how can I work with those people? 
So the first thing I did is said, okay, I'm going to be an agent. So I spent all my bar mitzvah money, <laughs> my first year in law school, working with a couple of NFL players and soccer players and stuff. And I actually got one of them drafted. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a great experience, but it opened my eyes up to realizing that you spend all your money and you do this. And, you know, there's not, you need to make sure you have a return on investment. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, it opened my eyes up to the sports agency business. And I even worked for the NFL Players Association after doing licensing deals, sponsorship, uh, a lot of work with agents and players. So is, is this an extension? Is, is this an extension of law? Like it sounds just like you're, you're, you're basically like a real estate agent except for people. Yeah. And you're exactly right. That's, that's what I've learned about the law. And, <laughs> you know, you could pretty much do whatever you want with it. It's great to have a JD, but at the same time, you know, they need agents. And most of the time to be an agent, like an NFL agent, you have to not only take a test with the NFL, but you have to have a graduate degree. So, you know, it puts you in different classes and in different levels just to even do stuff. And I'm not one of those guys who thinks I'm better than anyone because I went to law school with this. And in fact, a lot of my friends who didn't are, are better off, you know, because they don't have all the loans and, and all this kind of stuff. But it just, you know, it's, it's, it was a great opportunity for me to make me realize, you know, what I want to do and what I don't want to do. And sure. working with NFL players was fun. And I used my law degree for all that. Uh, but it allowed me to say, okay, I don't want to be an agent. I want to do similar stuff and be like an agent with sneakers and with businesses and brands that I like. So, so t let's talk a little bit about the timeline, right? Like, so when did you graduate college and then what was your first gig out of college? Was it managing NFL players? So sort of, so right after college, I said, I knew I wanted to go to law school. Uh, but to be honest, I partied and had too much fun in college. Uh, I played in the soccer team, <laughs> so I had a little too much fun. So only got into a couple of law schools. Uh, and one of them, you know, was a good one, Michigan State. But I said, okay, I'm gonna do a little more experience and work. So I went to Boston University, nice. uh, got my paralegal certificate. And to be honest, it was a great experience and I love it. And, you know, it got my foot in the door in some places. But I didn't really need to do that because when you go to law school, you know, paralegal, you don't need a certificate for that. Uh, but again, it, it let me know that I was on the right track and I wanted to go to law school. So after that, I applied and went to law school. And similar to uh, your past guest, I didn't sit still. You know, unlike in college <laughs> when I didn't just party and had a good time. I knew what I wanted to do. So I studied really hard, got all A's and B's, and I did an internship, externship, one or two every single semester. And after the first year, it was really all sports agents, sports, sports, sports. And that's when I realized that, hey, I need to veer off a little more, start working in the business side and getting brands and intellectual property because I like it, but I need to diversify. Sure. Uh, so so yeah. Did you, did you like have a, a stint at like an official firm or were you always kind of like this like we talk about freelance design all the time on this podcast, right? Cause that's like uh, a lot of our guests, but like, were you basically just freelance law consulting with people or did you actually like work for like a staple firm? Yeah. It's a great question. I did pretty much all the above uh, with, I was, like I said, I was very passionate. So similar to what you do and how I even found you just reaching out, I reached out to a bunch of attorneys and some of my friends and I actually worked for a couple months doing an agency with one of them. Uh, and then eventually started their own business. So it was really just small businesses, nothing. I, of course, I, my eyes were big. I wanted to work for the Nikes and the Adidas and stuff, but you know, it's tough. <laughs> so uh, in the meantime, I went to one of my uh, mentors who I'm still great friends with. And that's what I would definitely recommend to everyone. You know, find a couple people as much as you can that you could work and have a great network and mentorship. Uh, and when I spoke with my mentor, he told me, go get experience. You know, every lawyer who works at Nike or Adidas or New Balance or all these big brands, they don't just roll out of bed after the first year and, and get that job. So that was my strategy. After that, I said, okay, I'm going to get as much experience as I can in what I want to do. Uh, and at the same time, I knew that, you know, I wanted to do my own firm. So all through law school, I just kept working and doing similar tasks, like one-offs here, one-offs there, uh, worked for the NFL Players Association. So I was trying to get some bigger names on there as well. And then right when I graduated, I went to DC and did some work uh, as a, in an NFL and then worked for the Small Business Administration. But because I knew I wanted to work in sneakers, I also worked for Under Armour on the side. <laughs> so I was doing 40, 50, 60 hours a week and then coming over and selling shoes at Under Armour on the weekends. Uh, it started as just like a one month business kind of thing with them, but I liked it so much. They asked me to stay on uh, and sell shoes or do whatever I can just to stay in the business. Cool. And it really just, like I said, it just opened my eyes up to what goes on behind the scenes in, in sneakers and that kind of industry. So it was another opportunity where I was just tacking them on and going and going. How, 
how long did you do this shoot from the hip mentality of work? Um, <laughs> like you, it sounds like you had a core kind of stable structure, but then you're building these different avenues around it to eventually get you to where you are today. How long did you do that grind for? I mean, too, to be honest, I still do it today. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I guess taking it back a little bit. Those three years in law school were my work your butt off six months here, six months there, you know, get as much experience as I can. And then as soon as I graduated, it was trying to find, you know, more stable kind of things. But in this economy and this environment, it's, it's really hard. So that being said, when I graduated, the most experience I got was uh, working at the SBA for two years, which is a, a term position. But while doing that, you know, I was, like you said, shooting at the hip. Uh, I remember while working at the SBA, that's when I really started my, my law firm. And at the time, it was just Kurt's Law. Uh, no sneaker law, didn't, that kind of stuff didn't even <laughs> exist, really. Uh, so it was Kurt's Law, and I was doing the same thing. My buddy, who was a model in high school, reached out to me and said, hey, I'm starting a brand with my girlfriend. Can you help me do the trademark? Yeah, sure. So I did that, did the LLC work, did all that stuff. And then eventually, uh, you know, people are infringing on the trademark and you're going after and one thing led to the next and I was, you know, doing bigger stuff and bigger stuff. And it sort of was like you said, I was doing my 40 hour a week job at the same time and then doing another 20 hours of sneaker law. And then after, you know, my SBA job was done for two years, I worked for a software company and did that for two or three years. 40, 50 hours a week, and then doing sneaker law 20, 30, and building it up. So I, I really haven't stopped, <laughs> but at the same time, it's fun. And I like, and I, you have to learn how to say no. And I have, and it's, it's fun. And I'm, you know, keeping building that to get where I am today. So I want to push on the thought about, you know, two things, right? One, it sounds like you're building up clientele really through word of mouth and people just finding out you or their friends of friends or whatever. Uh, I, I feel like the industry is fairly small, so people get to know you. Um, but then secondly, like, talk about the core work itself, right? You mentioned, you know, infringing on patents and trademarks and kind of that process. But like, people like, th like, uh, uh, attorneys or lawyers, like, what is what is the core work that you are doing? Because I don't know if that's super clear for me. I think when I think of a lawyer, I think of somebody you, you, you pay a boatload of money to, to make sure that you don't get sued or that you're clean from getting sued. Um, but you have no idea what they actually do. So can you, can you like expand and educate me and everybody else? No, that's true. And I, I used the analogy before, it's sort of like the Wizard of Oz, the, the <laughs> wizard behind the curtain, like who the heck knows what goes on. But, but, uh, but yeah, in short, lawyers can do a bunch of things. And, and that's sort of why I feel like I'm, I'm all over in this conversation because you can have a specialized lawyer, uh, meaning one of my friends, like I first graduated and I did personal injury law in Florida. Uh, and that's literally, you know, someone runs into the car, you're getting it and you're going through insurance most of the time. You send sure. a demand letter to insurance and back and forth like that. Another area of law that I actually do is corporate law. And that's all over. That's where it's sort of hard to explain because as you know, as a business, when you have a startup, you might want to create an LLC. Uh, you know, if you hire employees, you might need to have an independent contractor agreement. You might need to have an employment agreement. Once you develop your brand, you should probably trademark it. You should probably get a design patent, you know. So I say I work in business and intellectual property, but it's, and it is, but it's, it's really 10 different types of law. So that's why going back to your question, I mean, I knew that I wanted to work in the Nikes and work for the, the big brands and stuff 10, 20 years ago. And to get that experience, you sort of have to be a generalist is what they say, uh, meaning personal injury for six months, know how to do it, uh, HR and employment stuff when that comes up and, and all this kind of stuff. Because as a general counsel, you, that's really your job. You need to know either a little bit of everything and some areas you could be advanced in, but you need to know what you don't need. <laughs> and that way you could reach out and hire people to do that. <laughs> so what would you, if you had to give somebody like the 80, 20 rule, right? Like what is, what is the 80% of your specialty? And then what's the 20% that like you'll do, but you don't really enjoy it? <laughs> yeah. So I love, as you see, trademark, copyrights, and, uh, and trademarks, copyrights, and contracts. That's my 80. Okay. I love, and especially with creative. I mean, an example that I give is everyone has a contract. You, know, you have a contract for goods is what they call it, which is a shoe. You know, a shoe is called a good. But if you go to one of these lawyers and, you know, they'll charge you, like you said, a lot of money. And they'll give you a contract and it talks about shipment of a good. What I like and what I think is better for this industry of everyone is to make that specific. Instead of it being a good, I'm shipping you 
a thousand new balances. I'm shipping you 10 shirts and all this. And, and, and that's, you know, what I think is the most, the fun part to me, I get these contracts and I specialize them to the industry uh, because by keeping it broad for goods or something, you know, you might miss a specific situation if there's an influencer involved or, you know, there's a lot going on in the sneaker industry. So I feel like now is the time to have these contracts and all the stuff specifically tailored. So going back to your question, 80% for me is contracts and trademarks. Uh, the 20 is really any and everything else. <laughs> if a client needs help, I'll do it. <laughs> sure. How do you, um, what I always like, whether it's an artist, a, you know, painter, muralist, uh, forward designer, whatever, a freelancer, like how do you find out what you're worth? Right. Like, I think that's like the, the question that everybody struggles with in any sort of field is like, how did you discover what to charge people? When do you get paid? Like, is it, do you, do you charge like per project or per client? Like as a one sum fee or is it an hourly basis or is it like project depending based on how excited you are? Do you, do you still do free work? Is that a thing? Like I have so many questions around this. Yeah. And, and you're, and you're right. And it, to be answer your question, all those are right. I mean, as an attorney, and I spoke with my uncle about this the other day because he's been doing it for 40, 50 years and people like that, I'm not talking trash, but you know, they've been doing it. So they say, okay, I charge a thousand dollars now and that's it. You don't have any wiggle room. You know, you literally don't have any wiggle room. Yeah, exactly. A thousand dollars an hour. Yeah, and that's cheap. I, I know people who are even more than that, uh, especially litigators, you know? <laughs> so, but what I do is what you said, I like, working with brands and I like working with creatives, people like you and such. And I understand because I've been in that situation that you might not have a thousand dollars an hour, <laughs> but at the same time, you need to protect your, your brand. You need to get a trademark or you should have a, as you know, a contract that says this designer is drawing this for me. I own it, not him. Uh, so what I do is depending on who you are and what the specific ask is, I work with you and you find hopefully a flat fee. Uh, but if it's something that I can't really judge, like, someone's coming after you, it might take four to 10 hours. Then we try and work out a reasonable uh, hourly fee. But what I pride myself in my firm is really just working with creatives and finding something that, you know, works for you and works for us. And, you know, whether we put it on a payment plan or something, you know, I, I like to help my clients where they need it. And especially for small businesses. So do you, to, to expand even further, like you see these commercials on TV, like maybe not so much anymore because nobody watches TV, but like, Back in the day, you'd see these commercials for like, we don't get paid unless you get paid. Like, is that like part of your strategy? Like, or do you get paid no matter what? <laughs> You're right. That's a real thing. That's a, that's a contingency <laughs> thing. Like, so for go, going back to the personal injury thing, most, a lot of personal injury lawyers take that strategy. They'll take your case and it'll be a contingency and they'll only get paid if they win your case and they'll take, you know, a third of it. I mean, everyone's different and such. But, uh, but yeah, that can, can happen. But usually in the business and intellectual property kind of fields, you don't do contingency like that. Uh, you hope to get the money up front, <laughs> but you try to work out an hourly fee or some sort of flat fee based on, you know, what, it's, what you're doing. Yeah, that's wild. Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier, going back to something you said, and I, I'm so happy I didn't forget to ask this question. You mentioned that you got, I think you got to a point where you're able to say no. To certain things right and that's to me what I find in talking to so many people is like that's the goal right like you want to get to a a, a, a a happy place where you're able to reject work because you don't necessarily need it not that you don't like the work but you 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 reach that point where your time is so valuable because you're focused on the best of the best that you're able to turn away other things have you one have you reached that point and then two how does it feel? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. And I'd say I, I definitely have reached that point, but it's not, I wouldn't think of it as like, yes, I'm there yet kind of thing. <laughs> uh, because at the same time, you know, when that kind of stuff comes up, I'm, I'm always thinking twice about everything. And I think that's sort of your job as an attorney. And I don't know if it's good or it's bad. And that's probably why I don't sleep that much. But, you know, you're always thinking of, hey, should I say yes to this guy? Or, you know, what are, if, if I do, what's the good? What's the bad? What's the this? So, I think I've definitely got to that level and I, I do like it. But at the same time, every time I say no, I'm always second guessing advice. Or I wouldn't say every time, a lot of it, because this stuff's so fun to me. And, you know, if someone comes to me and says, hey, I need your help here or there, and I, I want to be able to do it. But the most important thing to me is not just doing it or saying yes. I want to do it quick, you know, for my clients. And I want to do it really good. Uh, and that's, that's the no to me. The only reason I would say no is because I want to make sure that my product is, is really good, you know, and 
if time constraints, then you can't do that as well. Uh, is there is there a type of project or something that you haven't experienced yet that you want to experience? Like I imagine like at this point in your career doing it for let's call it 10 to 15 years at this point, you've, you've taken on a number of different projects, a lot of different clients. Is there like the, the holy grail of, of law in your brain that like you would love to just like have like that fuck you point of like reaching, you know, is there like that gold star that people go after? I, I think there is. I think there is. And I don't know. I don't know if it's whether you get with that one client that you like or whether you just get that feeling from doing something. And I think sure. that that's more of it for me. Like, I mean, I work with a lot of brands and you know how it could be one, it could be a one person brand or it could be a five person brand. The excitement to me is working with that one or two person brand and then seeing them grow one year, two years. Then, you know, as an attorney, you're turning it from an LLC to a corporation. There's a lot of work to be done there and that's exciting and it's fun times. And, you know, down the road, you see the finished product. And to me, that's the most important thing. I mean, I clearly wouldn't be doing this. If I was doing it for the money, I'd be going to these big firms and, you know, working there. But to me, it's more about working with these businesses and finding a passion and doing something that I like. Uh, Cause I've worked for software companies for five or six, seven, eight years. And when you have a product that you're working with that one, if you don't know what the heck it is, you're in trouble. And a lot of these tech companies, no one knows. The attorneys don't even know, you know? So uh, I'd rather work with a sneaker or something that I know about and I could draft a specific sneaker contract for so you could cover, you know, all the areas that are relevant, you know? And, uh, and to me, that's really the main thing, just continuing to get that gold star and building a brand or finding a company that I like and I could build with that brand. And that excites me. That's that's an that's awesome to hear and that's a great answer and I know that's probably like on script and it's really just it just it embraces I think your authenticity of this stuff and I you know hopefully whoever listens to this maybe they'll give you a call and they'll or maybe you're educating them to to try to do something more uh, to to cover their own bases and and grow themselves and reach out to you um, before you uh, I looked at your timeline on your website uh, a little bit earlier and. I think there was something around like a Hypebeast pop-up and I'd love for you to expand on that because Hypebeast is obviously a huge brand uh, that's very multi-million dollar business. Um, what was this pop-up thing that you managed for over a year or what was it and what did you do and what was your involvement? Okay, yeah, so I love the name, but no affiliation to the magazine, so. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> my bad. That was sort of another reason why I sort of shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> But in that vein, without getting in trouble, because there, we didn't really do anything, uh, it was, I saw, what I did is, I've been in the industry so long, and I saw, you know, I saw what goes on, I saw the sneaker cons, and I saw the culture, uh, and how everything is changing, and I guess I'll take a step back a little bit, because it sort of talks about how I got into a sneaker law firm and all that, uh, in sure. short, you know the sneaker industry is changing, <laughs> in, even in the past, you know, 10 years, 5 years, and by, what I say by that is, bots alone yeah yeah uh, discord groups you know all these big groups are getting money and investors are opening their eyes to sneakers because it costs so much money and and you know why not uh so for me i saw that and i i wanted to get shoes i wanted to add to my wall <laughs> pretty much but i couldn't do that like 2014 2015 turtle dogs came out and you know it was impossible to get that so i'm sitting here just as a consumer not even as a lawyer saying hmm how do i get these shoes so i started using these services box, ATC, discords, and, you know, by doing stuff, you learn, you know? Uh, so in that one year alone, I actually used some of these services. I got a bunch of shoes and I made friends. And that was, you know, when I sort of learned more about the industry and, and dove in and said, oh, wow, there's, you know, these discord groups probably need contracts for this. And, you know, that's sort of a software. And, and you know, just doing all that stuff allowed me to dive in and see what I want to do and, you know, where I want to help and how I want to, you know, work in the industry uh and i mean forget your question to be honest just going back no it was about the hype piece pop so that was a working name and that got you into sneaker law firm exactly that was so okay. yeah exactly so but long story short after seeing all these discords and stuff and working with everyone i said wow there's something to be had in this industry so i sort of created my own hype piece pop-up is what i call it and it was a mixture of a sneaker con with all my clients it was literally just me saying i'm gonna have a freaking party <laughs> so i literally had a party but with a physical clients. event it was an actual physical event, but like I said, it was different than the sneaker con and different. I wasn't trying to be in those lines. It was just a one event where I said, this is cool. I like this stuff. And so I brought all my clients over and I called it an experience because 
that's what I wanted to do. It wasn't just people walking around buying sneakers. We had influencers who were my friends up there signing. And it was just amazing to see little kids, 12, 13 year olds come up and waiting in line and getting these guys autographed. And just a smile on their face, you know? Uh, and from that to designers in the corner and people, you know, helping out to a photo booth we had and music. And it, it was a cool event. And that really is what I was trying to do, was trying to bring everyone together and have a community and experience. And uh, I realized that it can work, but because of what you said, because of the name, I sort of shut that down and pivoted. And I'm still sort of an entrepreneur as well as an attorney. So I'm trying to find how I can fit that into my other businesses. And so I got a couple of things going. Do you plan on doing that again? I mean, that sounds awesome. Yeah, it, exactly. I, I definitely do. And that's, it's, to me, it's all about having fun in the industry. Yeah. That was really just me working with my clients, my friends, have a big freaking party in a way. And I definitely plan on doing that again. I'm even in talks with a couple of people on how we can do that. So uh, yeah, I love it, man. But you're right. We'll keep the name <laughs> on the DL. Yeah. I mean, if you want, I'll cut it out of this episode. Yeah, no, you're good. Again, I, it's totally different and I'm not even worried about it. And it was, a, it was an LLC. We actually had an LLC under that name. So I don't think we did anything wrong. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so, so now transitioning to, to your time kind of under sneaker law firm, right? Obviously you're blending your passions and your background and your work and things like that. In your website specifically, you list probably a, a drop down menu of a dozen to 15 different kind of key things that you go after trademarks, patents, things like that. All that's great. And then you have a couple of random ones like cryptocurrencies and uh, esports. And so where's the connection? Is it another passion of yours to just branch off into these? Or do you just want to take over the world and do a little bit of everything? <laughs> I'm not picky in the brain style. That sounds good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it sort of goes back to the whole sports law, sneaker law kind of thing, because there's no real avenue, you know? Uh, when I wanted to do sports law, but sports law is a combination of you know, contracts, trademarks, you know, it's everything. And that's sort of what you see on there. I love working with creatives. And to me, creatives is sneaker design, streetwear design, all that kind of stuff. But it also includes NFTs and it also includes, you know, software and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I definitely don't want to take over the world. I realized that I can't because it's too much going on. So I want to try to stay more in my lane. And I think that's the, the focus that I'm in now, whether it's, you know, sneakers, streetwear, uh, crypto, NFTs, and, and again, all this stuff, it's not like I just came up with it and don't have any experience. My friend growing up in like 2012, before Bitcoin, Litecoin became big, was the one who was building all these machines. Uh, and in fact, he came to me and said, hey, I want to put three machines in your closet uh, so that I could mine Litecoin. I said, hey, that's a great idea. So I worked with him and we had a company and he was really doing that all over the East Coast. Instead of buying big warehouses, he would put like three machines in my closet, three machines in his girlfriend's closet in Pennsylvania. And, and it was all for energy reasons. So it was just, I had experience doing that and working with my friend. And it was like the early ages of Bitcoin and Litecoin. And, and it was just cool. So are now you, it's are you, a, you got in wicked early. Are you a billionaire? <laughs> no, no, it's Litecoin. <laughs> I mean, if I would have transferred some of that Litecoin into Bitcoin, ah, uh, maybe, but like, I got nothing now to be honest. That's why I got shoes. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun. You see, like, all that stuff is fun. Like, even telling that story is, is wild, you know? I remember, like, it was 100 degrees in the summer, and I have five Bitcoin machines right next to me in my closet, and it's making my heating bills hotter, and I'm, like, sweating trying to do law work. So, like, it's crazy stories, but, you know, it, in the end, 10 years on the road, it, it helps in the business world. <laughs> no, I, I love that you're able to say that and connect it to uh, a tangible experience because that's the big problem especially in the crypto and nft spaces so many people and i'm finding this out is you know they read about the let's let's use gary v's terminology you read about the push-up and then you go teach somebody how to do push-ups but you've never done the push-up yourself exactly and that's where we are and there's so many people like that with a fucking opinion yeah. And that want to, that are just listening or reading. And then they're going to say that back to people, but they've never done it. Yeah, exactly. And so here you are like, I had these machines. I'm sweating my ass off. <laughs> it was funny. Exactly. But you're right. Like by doing that, I know, you know, what an LTC is and what a wallet is. And like, you know, when people come to you and say, Hey, I need to do this NFT, you know what it is. So I think you hit the nail on the head there. Cause to me, that's the most important thing in sneakers and in everything, you know, it's so easy for people to write a tweet 
or do a YouTube or, you know, have their opinion. And they're entitled to their opinion. But you have these 12, 13, 14, you know, whatever age you are, people watching this and they're believing you, you know? So for sneakers, I mean, the reason I even started my sneaker law firm is because I heard so many people saying incorrect stuff about sneakers and IP and this. And I just don't want these young, impressionable people who are the next generation to believe this stuff if it's not true. And I'm not saying I'm always right. I'm certainly not always right, you know, but like, you know, that, that's, that's important to me. You know, if you're going to educate and you're going to put words out there, at least do your due diligence. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. Um, I'm not always right, but I have a law degree, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, not all lawyers are right all the time. I've known that too. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I have that in for comic relief. <laughs> no, I um, like it. It's true. Um, talk, I, I've been meaning to, uh, to ask this question, but I was, I was waiting for the right moment. So uh, we, uh, and the, what sparked it was you just started talking about all this false information and, and you said we, we obviously interacted and met over Clubhouse like a lot of my, my former guests of recent times. And what I find on there is, is, is we basically gave everybody a microphone uh, to their opinion and it's the same concept, right? People are just sharing the things and they're saying a lot of false information. And so you found this opportunity of like, hey, like I want to correct that, that narrative and I want to you know, provide a little bit more positive kind of feedback and, and, and rightful action. Um, and in doing so, you've built up this social media following um, around sneaker law firm and that's really, in my opinion, from watching from the background, even over the past few months, it's grown a lot. And, yeah. and I, I actually scrolled way back when to your first post in 2015. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and your content like layout actually hasn't changed. It's still very lighthearted. It's fun. It's meme oriented. Yeah. It's, it's check out this patent. It's, but it's so informative. It's, yeah it's wildly educational to like have it pop up and like you, you see a patent and you're like able to flip through and you're able to read about things and educate yourself. Whereas in this fast format, like legal as a whole just seems daunting. Like it's all this paperwork, it's all this information. And you've basically been able to, to create this like lighthearted way around it. Like talk about that experience, like, and how valuable that's been for you and maybe even your business. Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to sort of educate, uh, you know, as much people as I can in a small little bit because everyone, including myself, we have two seconds a day to scroll and read. So, you know, these law things, I, for example, the Nike complaint from last week, 65 page complaint, you know, I might be the only one in the world who read that other than the Nike people, you know, like no one actually read all 65 pages of that. So to, to me, that's the toughest thing. Just, and I'm sure every lawyer has the same thing. How do you narrow down what's important? in 65 pages to 65 you know, sentences a word. Uh, but that's sort of what I'm trying to do. As you know, there's, there's a lot that is in the sneaker and design community that people don't even know. And I, sometimes, some stuff I don't even know. You know. I went to law school to learn it. And I think it's important just to put it on there because some of the stuff doesn't even make sense. Like the, the pick stuff with your own pictures. I have so many people commenting about the copyrights and your own pictures and such. But, but, uh, but yeah, it, it was been a great experience just like you said, just continuing to be myself, funny and, you know, what I think this is or that, but putting a little bit of education in there as well, from patents uh, and trademarks to, you know, just, hey, this case is cool, here comes college sports cards, that kind of stuff. So it's fun, it's great, and you're exactly right, it's grown a lot, and I'm appreciative of everyone who follows me and everyone who's listening, and every time I see that comment, oh, wow, good job, thank you for, you know, letting me know this, it makes me feel good, uh, because, you know, that stuff takes time. Uh, and it's most of it, it's me, you know, I have my own firm and I have to do a lot of work and I have a couple people helping assistance and such, but that kind of stuff is me. So it takes time. So it's good to hear that people are actually using it and understanding it. And again, if you have questions come, I mean, I, I like learning from people too. So if I say something wrong or if something's different, put it in the comments there and let me know. And that's really what I think this is about having a discourse and educating people about everything and anything. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I, I love that. And I, that's pretty much the purpose of this podcast is just to educate people in a different format and, and just branch out a little bit. Um, so I have a question around, around work, right? Because I get this question a lot myself is like, do you have a balance like, or a work-life balance, or is it just kind of all in one? Like you, you mentioned 50, 60 hours earlier in, in the episode, like, do you, how do you separate that? Or do you just, are you nonstop all the time? And then you figure out, you know, when you want to still party or like, <laughs> like, how do you, what, what's your life look like? 
And you're right, man. It's, it's a good question. I talk about this with my therapist all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's wild because I guess it went in, up and down and it, it goes in times. Uh, previously, when I first graduated, I was doing working nine to five for another company. Uh, and also uh, nine to five. So when I was done with that, I'd come home and do sneaker law. So that was the same thing, 60, 70, 80 hours. But it was more, it was more separated because I had to go into the office and do, do that kind of stuff. Now with my own firm, I still have the big software clients and like the Patreons I work for and doing work for other creatives and keeping in the genre that I like. But because I work for myself, it's a little different juggling aspect, you know? I'm still working 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week uh, whenever it's needed for my clients. But I think, like you said, being able to put a hold on and having a day where you recharge and, and all that is extremely important. And I didn't do that early on. I did exactly what you said juggling everything like a crazy man you know and it, it takes time and experience and you know when to learn to say no and when to learn to say okay yeah i could do this for even 24 hours or i can't do this for even 24 hours because that's what it comes down to you when you're a lawyer whether you're in-house in you know these big corporations or whether you're outside counsel or whether you're just working with a one-person company like everyone wants something done asap <laughs> and they call you and say hey here's let's do it tomorrow so you have to prioritize and learn which to juggle now and here and there. After doing that for 10 years, I think I learned a little better. I'm still learning, <laughs> but uh, I think that's the key, just learning which one to prioritize and which one to say, okay, chill, I'm going to party, you know? So did you, did you have a moment in life where you just like, it was like a self-reflection period of like, Zach, you can't keep this up any longer. Like you, you are that crazy man juggling way too many balls in the air right now. Like you need to tone it back. Like, was there a defining moment for you? Yeah, I've had, to be honest, I've had that one, two, at least three times, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I think, and, and I'm not talking trash about any company or anything like that, but I think it was when I was, you know, doing that kind of work. And I was working in-house corporate counsel, 50, 60 hours for some of these companies with products that I wouldn't say I didn't like, but it was just like, it, it was more like a job there. Everyone just threw stuff at you and you just need to get it done. And it was no communication or talking or anything. And after doing that for a couple of years, I realized, wow, you know, I, I, you know, I can't do this because it's such a task here. And then when I want to do the stuff that I actually like, like the sneaker stuff and working with my clients there, it was draining on me. And I had to say, okay, this isn't the right position for me, you know, and, and you stop and you pivot and you do something that you like. And I did that even recently in the, uh, during the pandemic. And I think that was the eye opener to me uh, during the pandemic when I, I love working at home and, you know, no one lets you work at home before the pandemic. So the pandemic was an opportunity to allow me to work from home. And I've just constantly been grinding, like not sleeping that much, but just building my vision and my dream for sleeper law firm and all that. And I think once you have one of those opportunities at a company that you don't like, or you don't really get along with and with the products, it, it's easier to, to pivot. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, so you're, I guess to, to, to capture that, all of that, it's like today, are you, are you happy where you are? Do you have balance in your life? Like, are you in a good place? Like, is there something that you still need to make time for? Or like, where do, where do you live today? I'm, I'm one of those guys who I'm always happy. And that's why I like your podcast and following you on Instagram because I always have positive vibes. You know, I'm always happy no matter what I'm doing. Even if I'm working until two or three in the morning, I'll find a car ride an hour so I can watch you know, entourage or you know, some show on HBO or something that I actually like uh, and do that. So I'm always going to be happy uh, no matter what I'm doing, especially now that I'm working in sneakers and I know that's what I'm going to be doing for forever. So uh, yeah, I'm happy, but you're right. Like nowadays in any job, I feel like there's going to be times when you have stress and you have to take a break and you know, you're going to have to figure something out. And I think I've worked on some areas where I, when that happens, I have some outlets and that's important. Gotcha. Um, in regards to like law and kind of creatives in general, what's like something like a piece of advice you would give people, you know, is it to trademark your name? Is it to, is it to, you know, trademark your creations? Is it to work this line into your contract? Like what's something that you like would recommend to like individual creators? Cause I, the reason why I ask the question is a, a lot of people are freelancers that, that do listen to this and I'll, I'll, I work for a company, right? So like I have my contract, it's separate. Like I can't do this. I, I understand that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but for other people, like what's a, what's something that they might not know or they haven't experienced getting screwed over on that you would kind of shed light onto for them. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of, there's a lot of areas that 
that <laughs> to be honest. But I really think it's just, and, and we've talked about it in Clubhouse and I've heard you guys talk about it, but nowadays the world is so connected, you know, the Instagrams and this, and I feel like people want to take those opportunities, especially using the sneaker designers as an example. They want to take that opportunity to work for the big brands. But you know, it's impo it's very hard to do that. So what people are doing is putting it on their Instagram and, and doing you know, creative ways to get their name out there. And it's great, I like it. And it's certainly worked for some people. Uh, but then in converse to that, you see the people who get their art stolen. Uh, so it's, it's a tricky situation because we wanna be connected and everyone, it's so easy to be connected, but you have to actually think about the legal aspects. And, and that's sort of where the lawyers come in because you know, there's ways to protect your work through copyrights or trademarks and all that stuff before you're putting it on Instagram or, or even, if, or even if you're going to do that, you might want to talk to an attorney first just to know, hey, if I do this, these are the, you know, these are the areas that could come up. So I, I guess for me, it's just think before you create. Yeah, that's the most important thing because I have so many people come to me who create something amazing and I love it. You know, I'm like, holy crap, I want to buy those shoes. I want to buy this design, you know, and then I do my little trademark search and someone has it 10 years ago already. And you now that's cool. And you might be able to get away with it, but you don't want to build a brand looking over your shoulder and and that's what i see happens a lot you know people don't even think about a trademark or a copyright and they start building their brand and doing all this stuff and then five years later they're looking over the shoulder they're scared that someone's going to sue them or someone does sue them and then they have to totally rebrand so it's an awesome industry and it's even you know more important now because people are getting connected so easy so i think you just need to make sure you do your due, due diligence first and don't be afraid to talk to attorneys uh you, like you said that costs a lot but some attorneys like me do a 15 minute consultation for free. And you know, there are ways to speak to people to make yourself feel better and not look over your shoulder. And I would say, if I was a creative, that's what I would say, do, you know, awesome. Keep doing what you do and, you know, but let the attorneys do their work so that you can do what you want to do. You know? So to, to nerd out a, a tiny bit more in a specific example, uh, I saw on LinkedIn or something like that, like a designer, you know, put some designs out there on the internet and then a Chinese brand copied it. And so is there, is there anything you can do about that? Or should you just not piss and moan about that and just accept the fact that, Hey, you created something cool and somebody replicated it. <laughs> well, yeah, you're exactly right. There's a million different ways you could take it, but like what it comes down to, and I hate hearing this is money, you know, and it's not really just money with like hiring an attorney, but it's like any way you look at it to go after someone who steals your work, it's going to take time, energy and money, you know, and the easiest, best way to do that is if you protect it in advance with a trademark or a copyright. So using that example, you said, I don't know what the design he is, he created or whatever he did, he, he could have you know, protected that beforehand so that when he put it online and it was stolen, then you have an easier claim or an easier way to make that claim. Uh, otherwise, without that actual ownership, because you know, that's the most important thing, without ownership, you're sort of you know, going up a hill. Uh, and when it's something in China, China's laws are totally different than America. So then you have to ask that question again, I'm gonna have to hire an outside counsel in China to litigate this. It's gonna be double and triple as expensive. And most of the time, they're small artists. You know, it's individual people who don't have money to even build a brand, but they certainly don't have money to go after a Chinese attorney and like hire them and do all that stuff. So, it, and that's really what it's come to. You know, there's these big brands and these little brands and the disparities are, are so different. And I love working with both of them, but the creatives are usually with the little brands. And it's just a sad situation when you see what, you know, what you just said happened when a designer wants to put his name out there and put it on LinkedIn and next thing you know, someone takes it. Uh, and they still have, you know, you still have common law rights and there are ways to go after them, but you see it, it's tough to do. And yeah. I guess an example I think of, sorry, a quick example is the whole future, Futura thing. Yeah. You know, uh, the North Face, he hired an amazing lawyer. The guy's a, a great lawyer, came up, federal claims they brought, had a great argument for a transformative kind of trademark and they lost. But then they had a great social media strategy and they won the social media strategy, you know? So that, that's really what we see nowadays. You know, it's either you take legal action if you have enough money or you have to go in the social media strategy because social media is just as important nowadays. It's crazy. So uh, to, to get specific on recent events too, I, I'd love your take uh, if you're willing to share it on, you know, you, you've been sharing some of the stuff of, of Nike trying to protect themselves on silhouettes and specific parts of the shoe that customizers and other creatives have been selling and, and marking up and doing creative around. And it's not the same product. It's a different artistic take. 
where do you stand in something like that? That's I love it because I'm a big I love working with customizers and creatives and bootlegs and all that stuff. But it's 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 wild. It's because you know every you have to take every shoe and every case for itself. You know, and the facts for itself in there because you know it, it's either if you put a Nike swoosh on it, you know that's a Nike trademark. And if you take that off, but you have that same trade dress silhouette, it makes it a whole different thing, you know? So that's where every single case is different to me, you know, and it's nuanced and it's very, it's wild just to see what's going on because of what you just said. Like Nike always goes through shifts and where they, you know, hire different counsel and all this stuff. And, you know, most stuff is public knowledge out there. So you could sense some sort of shift in the past, I'll say two or three years in sure. protecting, like you said, these trade dress designs. Uh, and I mean, speaking of that, it's, you know, the Jordan one, high, low, there's the three, four, five, 11. I mean, that's just been in the past year. These are all just trade dress designs without the swoosh. So clearly they see these customizers and these people using these designs. And, and even it's not, it's not even customizers. It's also Walmart. <laughs> Walmart made like a shack looking shoe. That's like a Jordan 11. So, you know, it's, it's really just Nike and all these big companies doing what they should do. They're seeing other companies stealing their intellectual property. And they're saying, hey, how can we go after them? The best way to do that is to have a federal trademark. So they're applying for this uh, instead of having common law rights just from, from using the mark for 30 years. So, so how, it's interesting. How, how does a, a flip of the coin, how does a creative avoid getting uh, a, an email or cease and desist by Nike <laughs> or yeah. anybody else for that matter? Yeah, you're exactly right. I get calls on that every single day. That's a secret, secret sneaker law from Okay, okay. So you gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta, you gotta, you gotta call Zach if you're interested in that question. We'll avoid that. Yeah, it sucks. I can poke around a bit of a little, but yeah, but that, I mean that's the question. You know, if you look, that's really what happens. How do, how does this one person who has a custom shoe and just paints over the Nike thing differ from someone who creates his own shoe from the ground up, you know? And everyone's different. And using the cases from last week as an example, both those people have some form of building their own Nike swoosh or building their own upper, you know, and, and yeah. that's, that's where those cases separate themselves from the other people, you know, but it's, it's very technical and each one's different. So people see this and they say, Oh my gosh, all I do is paint over shoes. They're coming after me. And I mean, that might not be the case, but you never know. And it really depends on which trademark you use or, you know, how you're promoting yourself or marketing yourself. I mean, people, you know, when you have a website online, if you say, you know, Nike shoes for stuff. Clearly, you probably shouldn't use the word Nike on your website. You know what I'm saying? So there's little tricks like that where people come to me and say, hey, how do I sell my shoe without getting sued? Or how do I sell my shoe with limiting liability? And that's what you have attorneys for. They can say, hey, the court said this is illegal, so don't do this. Uh, that's I love that. Th thanks for providing a little bit of insight there. And if you want to nerd out even more, you got to make sure that you you reach out and 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 pay the man. So <laughs> that that's enough for you, for you advice for now. Um, last two questions, Zach. Uh, the first question is where can people find you if they want to follow your journey and kind of learn more about you? Um, where can people get in touch? Yeah, it's at Sneaker Law Firm. I Instagram and I have a Twitter account, and I mainly use those two, but. I'm looking to, you know, get other social media as well. So it should be at Sneaker Law Firm and everything. Do you, uh, you mentioned Discord earlier. Do you have like a Sneaker Law Firm Discord? It's obviously like, it's been around for a while, but it seems that over the past three, four, five, six months, it's actually like boomed. Yeah, yeah, it really has. I have my own account where I work with my own, uh, what's it called? I just work with some of my clients on their own groups and stuff. But, but you're right, like the goal for me is using the Instagram to sort of educate and stuff. And I've thought of different ways, whether it's, clubhouse or having a discord thing to you know get the news out there uh and i'm flirting with that so yeah not yet but soon enough <laughs> all right cool uh we'll, we'll have to stay tuned for that and then so last question and i always like to end you, you mentioned you're you're a happy guy you're a positive guy um what's what's one thing that you'd leave the audience with you know just as a general you know perspective or a piece of advice or you know, something that you've learned along the way that's really helped you or like a core staple kind of saying that you've, you've learned that, that you kind of go back to and reflect on daily or, or weekly or whatever it is. Hmm. I was thinking about this because after watching your podcast, well, everyone says such great things. Oh gosh, shoot, I, I, would, I would say that. I want to say that. So <laughs> I'll, I'll echo what Miles and almost everyone else is saying in regards to be you, you know, make sure that whatever you do, you're, you're being you and you're being true to yourself. And that's sort of how sneaker law firm got found. And that's why I'm happy today. And 
over time, by taking jobs that I didn't like, by taking jobs that I did like, by, you know, just living life, you learn that, you know, the more true to yourself you are, the better you are. And you're going to make it in business or whatever if you do that. So I echo that. Uh, and I'll add on top of that to uh, just make sure you're prepared. You know, everything in life is, you know, education or preparation. And to me, I love learning new things. So whether it's, you know, just preparing for this podcast and educating and listening to your podcast or listening to the million other podcasts that are out there, try to learn something new every day. Uh, and that's what I would say, uh, just advice to you. Make sure you're having fun and learn something new because you'll never know when that cool story or that nerdy thing that you just learned will be relevant. And it could impact your job or your future. So. Yeah, if you don't put yourself out there and educate yourself, that you'll never have certain opportunities that will cross your path. You're just not exactly. prepared in that time. So I love that. Uh, Zach Kurtz, thanks for joining us so much on episode 44 of An Until Near. This has been a lot of fun, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. I wish I could talk more. I could talk to you all day. So thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs>